risk for the U.S. household is that as the dollar is rejected, you're going to see the impact economically of that rejection. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today we have a very special guest with us, Jim Willie, editor of the Hat Trick newsletter found on GoldenJackass.com website. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Oh, my, my pleasure, Dunnigan. We wanted to have you here because you are uh, you have a wide following in the area of people who are real money enthusiasts. You have quite a background in precious metals. If you could give us just a two-minute rundown of uh, a little bit of your background so people know where you come from, and uh, we'll get on into some of the questions that we've got for you today. Okay, well, by, by profession and training, I'm a uh, statistical analyst with background in marketing research, uh, retail sales forecasting and analysis, and quality control. Those are three big areas of statistical practice. Um, I earned a PhD back in 1980 at Carnegie Mellon University, and with those three fields, I practiced uh, for about about 22 years, 23 years, and uh, then I started the the website for Golden Jackass because I came to a very weird conclusion that since I was unencumbered by the limitations of economics credentials, which is a real nice mouthful, I, I had a big advantage over economists who were lousy at their trade, lousy at their craft. And I started the website realizing that, you know, a statistical analyst makes for a better economist than trained economists who are basically harlots for the government and Wall Street and uh, really propagators of heresy uh, in line with the Keynesian school that has been unbelievably abused and now has wrecked the system with its debt saturation. So that's my background, uh, statistical analyst, and uh, I kind of miss analyzing the several hundred thousand record data sets and coming up with models and and uh, you know business applications to save millions but this is a higher purpose a higher mission now we have you on here because a lot of our guests are keenly interested in knowing how they can in increase the resiliency and protection for their family's well-being specifically financially in this respect and your background in being an advisor to people about strategies that they can use to recognize the real value of uh, precious metals for one uh, is one of the reasons we have you here and we'll jump right into our first question and that is a basic one what makes gold and silver real money in contrast to the US dollar well, I'd like to start with the dollar because it's it's not money, and uh, here, here's the difference, and this is a, a key point, and it's overlooked by intelligent people, and it explains a lot of things. The dollar is declared as legal tender. What that means is the government has said the dollar can be used to settle debts, public and private, and to carry out transactions. You pay your rent, you buy your milk. You, you, you take a loan from Joe and he pays you off the 20 bucks he owes you and, and you get dollars. Th that doesn't mean the dollar's money. It means legal tender and to be used in the society and economy. Well, in primitive cultures, they use salt. 300 years ago in the U.S., in the colonies, many parts of the nation, before it was actually a nation, used wampum, which was beaver pelts. And, and other skins. So, you know, you can make any agreement you want on what you use as legal tender. It doesn't make it money. The dollar by its na nature is backed by U.S. government debt. And, you know, they don't come out and say, here, we've got the dollar, and, and you know, it's backed by our, our treasury debt, U.S. government debt, and uh, unfortunately our debt is growing. Now, they don't talk that way. It's a default statement and conclusion. Something always underpins a currency. 
If it's not gold back, it's based on faith. Well, then the faith is on what? Faith based on Idi Amin and his declaration in Uganda that this is the currency that, that we will make good? Okay, it's based on people's word. It's based on actions of a central bank. It's based on action of a government. It's based on performance of their debt. And that's what's going on with the United States. In effect, the dollar is a debt-denominated coupon with 1, 5, 10, 20, and 100 markings for usage in a broken economy. So the conclusion is that the U.S. citizen wealth is now subject to write-downs because of the, the problems with the money. It's not money. The dollar is not money. Ask people what's the difference between money and legal tender, and they look at you like you're crazy. But the write-downs are also going to happen with the U.S. government debt. We've, we've in a sense, got a, a tremendous write-down coming for our whole society. All right, what is real money? We know what the dollar is. It's legal tender, and it's, it's badly abused. What is real money? Well, gold and silver qualify as real money from the criteria that a lot of oh, historians and, and experts have studied and declared. Uh, and here are the requirements. I'm going to go one by one. It's, it must be fungible, which means, well, you've got a bar of gold. I've got a bar of gold. Well, we can trade, and they're both good, as long as they have you know, approval of, of, say, purity, uh, and they've got stamps on them. My, my stamp might have the U.S. government on it. Your stamp might have a Canadian mint on it. Another one might have a Russian mint on it. Another one might have the Krugerrand coin. All right, so there are lots of standards for fungibility, which means that you can trade, and that they're all good. doesn't matter which you hold. They're all good. It must be transportable, which means... I can take mine and, and go down to uh, Guatemala from New York and, and set up shop, create a business and whatever, and use my gold coins, which are recognized as I transport to Guatemala. Or a guy in Europe in Switzerland can move to Norway and take his you know, bars of silver, and they'll be recognized and transportable and redeemable. They must be recognized, which is kind of mixed in with points I've been making. Um, gold, even in South African nations, in the Middle East, in, in primitive cultures, gold is recognized. All right, that's very important. It must stand the test of time. And I like to make a couple of examples. One is cute and one is you know, more in tune with, with historical events. If I decide that I'm going to bury at sea, not so much sea, but in a lake, in Lake Michigan, uh, you know, the northern parts, no, northern suburbs of, of Chicago say, I go, you know, 600 yards out, and I'm right next to this one buoy, and I go down, it's 250 feet deep, and I bury it in a chest. All right, I can bring that back up in four years, and it's still gold coins. It's still good. It's still valid. And the other one is uh, you could find a shipwreck 100 years from now after you bury, you know, somewhere in the Caribbean off an, your favorite island. Uh, well, maybe you get killed or you die. And someone discovers your chest of gold that's buried next to the Bermuda Islands uh, using your map that they discovered in their basement. Whatever. Okay, there are lots and lots of stories of discoveries, and there are a lot more to be discovered because there was so much war back then. Uh, if you bring it back up a hundred years later, it's still good. It stands the test of time. It must also be inert, which means copper cannot be money because it, it oxidizes and turns green. You know, anyone who's got some uh, you know, drip on a, an old bathtub in an old house, you might see a little green stain next to the drip. Well, that's from copper. Uh, oxidizing on your plumbing, your, your, your pipes feeding the bathroom. And the last thing, it, it must not be counterfeitable, which, you know, the dollar is one of the most counterfeited currencies in the history of mankind. It's being counterfeited by the CIA. They stole some 
Department of Treasury plates back in 2005. Uh, there are widespread stories that Iran is the world's best counterfeiters outside the United States. That's one of the conflict points that we have with with Iran. They, they're counterfeiting the $100 bills. As soon as we come out with a new one, they counterfeit that too. They just get a copy and get their craftsmen to make new ones and they've got the, the metal plates and they know how to do it anyway. So fungibility, portability, recognition, standing time, inert and counterfeiting, those are the criteria necessary to qualify for real money. And outside of gold and silver, you just don't have any. We've got cotton-based paper parchment as the basis with ink on it for dollars. With little metal strips, you know, to be sure, and clever watermarks, to be sure. I mean, we got a quote from uh, John Snow, who was a Department of Treasury uh, secretary for the Bush II administration. He actually has a quote. He said, the most important thing for a strong currency is make it difficult to counterfeit. No, it's not. It's gold backing. I mean, I mean, some people wonder, why was John Snow ever selected by the Bush administration to be a Treasury Secretary when he had no finance experience? I mean, people need to really start asking critical questions out there. What did John Snow bring to the table? He was the CSX Railroad CEO, the executive, a railway executive with distribution centers and port facility access. Can you say narcotics distribution? That's what he brought to the Treasury Department. Narcotics distribution routes. Your point also about uh, parchment having no inherent value is brought home because we toured the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C., and they made the strong point at the end of the production line when they show these big uncut sheets of bills coming off that look for all the world like the currency that we, we handle every day. And they said, now, just be aware that we don't make money here. We just we just make paper and ink. That's all it is. So we wrap it up and send it over to our customer, the Federal Reserve, and they monetize it, and then it's money. And uh, it just sounded like uh, nothing but magic, and that's side and it makes you really realize that there's nothing else going on behind that to, to really have value. So with all that you've told us about gold and silver having the properties that are inherent and required for something to be considered true money, why is this time right now a good time to acquire gold and silver? Well, basically because the dollar is being rejected globally, it's, it's run its course. Uh, the, the dollar is dying. The dollar is being rejected. The dollar is done. Uh, Americans are the last ones to know it because they're the worst informed by the press. They also are one of the worst educated when it comes to money and finance and economics. I, I find very few people who answer the question properly, what's the difference between the dollar and money? What's the difference between legal tender and money? They have no idea. They think, I'm stupid when it's the other way around, perhaps. Uh, we're going now through the final phase of the dollar in its pathogenesis. Uh, for those who thought that the 0% interest rate policy and the quantitative easing for bond purchases by the Fed, those who thought that those steps were to revitalize could not be more wrong. Those are death events. This is a propping of Bernie. <laughs> and there's, a, there's a movie in the 90s called uh, Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, and it, it's for Bernie who died. And the two kids try to make it look like Bernie's still alive. Because they've got business to do and they've got meetings to make and, and decisions to make that depend on Bernie. Maybe his signature as well. Well, the United States dollar is dead. And it's being propped by QE. It's not being revitalized. It's being kept pumped up. A cadaver is being pumped up. And, and the government officials speak for Uncle Sam. It's pathetic. But the East has been rejecting the dollar lately, Eastern nations. For those who are curious, why, what's the big beef with the United States and Russia lately? It's not over Ukraine. That's just a, you know, a, a cause celebre, um, celebrated cause. Um, 
It's that Russia is leading the movement away from the dollar. Uh, Saddam Hussein started taking oil sales payments in euros, so we attacked him. Your, Iran, for years, has been taking non-dollar payments, and we attack them and make up stories about their nuclear capability, which is such a fabrication, it's, it's insulting to the intelligence of the listener. All right, the Eastern Alliance, led by the BRIC nations, are working on a gold and silver-backed currency right now. It's not an easy task. When you have a gold and silver-backed currency, or a currency backed by that and, and other commodities like crude oil, <clears throat> the designers must create uh, linkages between the currency market and the commodity markets that are firm and, and fixed. That's not easy to do. Unfortunately, the, the criminals regarding money and banking, namely the United States and Britain, uh, and in parts of Western Europe that follow our lead, they're very expert at banking in a legitimate way. What they've done is they've turned it illegitimate and criminal and mixed in narcotics, money laundering, and counterfeiting of bonds. For I got a, just a quick, quick counterfeit story I forgot to mention the previous answer. J.P. Morgan has sold twice as many treasury bonds as there were created from U.S. government debt securitization. They've sold twice as many bonds as were created. They're counterfeited two for one. Um, Russia and China are leading a movement right now to create an alternative to the dollar, which the whole world realizes now is corrupted. The Americans tend to think, well, no, it's revitalizing. We got the stimulus. It's not a stimulus. That's capital destruction. We have trade settlement now increasingly not occurring in the dollar. And a remarkable development is that the number of American, U.S.-based firms that are settling their trade in Chinese currency, it's called the yuan, it's also called the renminbi, or you're starting to hear a lot more RMB. RMB is like USD. USD is dollar. RMB is renminbi, the Chinese currency. It's synonymous with the yuan. The number of American companies, U.S. companies, settling trade in RMB, Chinese currency, ha has, has been growing rapidly. And the volume of that trade is up something like fivefold in the last year. Now, it's not a huge number. It's still in the 1%, in the 1.5%, 1 2% range. But in the next couple of years, it's going to get up toward 10, 15, or 20. So the dollar is being avoided more and more. Much Chinese settlement uh, is being done, Chinese yuan settlement, is being done by their regular trade partners like Korea, Vietnam, Japan, Russia. Uh, a big deal was just made for, a, oh gosh, a $400 billion long-term trade deal between Russia and China using pipelined oil, pipeline gas, extensions to pipeline. They call it the Holy Grail energy deal. It's not going to be settled in dollars. It's going to be largely settled in RMB, the Chinese currency. Now, why is all that important? Because as nations use the dollar less for trade settlement, they're going to hold fewer treasury bonds in their banking system as reserves. When they realize they don't need the dollars to settle trade like in primarily crude oil, they're going to get rid of their treasury bonds. They're going to diversify out of their reserves held in dollar denomination. So trade is going to lead the bank reserves practices. The other big reason is that, that you know, again, it's not very much in the U.S. press. It's all over the press in the Asian, Middle East, and European world. There's a massive divorce in progress, and it's not early, it's, it's middle stages between the United States and the Saudis. The petrodollar is dead. It's not completely dead, but it's very, very weak. And, you know, the U.S. buys its crude oil and pays in dollars, and, and many European company, countries still pay uh, the Saudis for their oil in dollars, but 
when the Saudis make an announcement in the next couple months that non-dollar payment for oil, namely petrodollar payments, are going to be phased out by the Sa Saudis, we're going to have a shockwave hit the dollar and the U.S. economy. So the petrodollar is dead in the entire Gulf region. We're talking about UAE, Oman, uh, Qatar, Kuwait. These nations are all going to do the same thing. They're going to move away from the dollar. And as they accept other currencies for their oil, they're going to diversify their tremendous reserves. Just the Gulf nations, those Persian Gulf nations that I just mentioned, plus the Saudis and Bahrain, they hold $2.3 trillion in just sovereign wealth fund uh, reserves. So they're very rich, very wealthy, and I'm thinking at least half of that, like one and a quarter trillion or so, is held in treasury bonds. So they're going to start dumping them. The dollar is ready for the dustbin of history, Donegan. It's become toxic. I mean, these sound like fantastic words. Oh, gosh, there goes a the jackass being, you know, exclamatory again, exaggerating. No, quantitative easing by the Fed is heretical. If you had asked Alan Greenspan in 1994, do you think the Federal Reserve will ever do quantitative easing in an unsterilized fashion to the tune of 50 to 80 billion dollars a month? He would say, of course not. That would mean that we're approaching a debt default. That would mean that we're ruining the dollar. That's exactly what we're doing right now. But the dollar is, is toxic, not just because of the central bank activity, to print money and cover the debt. They're monetizing the U.S. government debt. They're monetizing past housing debt, the mortgage bonds. It's toxic not just from the Fed's activity, but from Wall Street fraud, the, the counterfeiting that they're involved with, uh, the contract fraud based on, on you know, all the different mortgages, uh, the huge deficits of the U.S. government, the endless war. We're conducting war using the dollar and forcing the targets of our war to finance the treasury bond that finances our war machine. This has never been done in history, and it invites the target nations to abandon the dollar. They're financing the attack on their countries by investing in treasury bonds. The U.S. economy is, is an entire credit card abuse example. We've got $400 billion a year in trade deficits. We gave away our industry to Asia. We call it outsourcing. It sounds really sophisticated. Yeah, it's not. We, we've killed our financial status. Our integrity is gone. So you buy gold and silver because the dollar is going away. As the dollar goes away, gold and silver will rise. Don't pay any attention to the COMEX price. Only goombas and, and nitwits follow the gold price every single day. I follow the events that are largely coming out of the East and now more and more in Europe for the disposal of the dollar and its rejection. And the biggest upcoming events are two, the Saudis announcing acceptance of non-dollar payment for oil and the Germans abandoning the euro and working closely with Russia and China for a new gold-backed BRICS currency. Those are the two big events. Well, that leads to the next, that related to the next question is, you've been describing the death of the dollar and how it's being propped up like the corpse at Weekend at Bernie's. So that's a distraction away from the alternative, which would be real money, a silver and gold. So what is there that this uh, head fake is actually uh, being practiced on the other side by the by the powers that be that governments, central banks, and others really do recognize the importance and value of gold and silver more than they're letting on, so that they're distracting us to continue to have uh, faith and confidence in this debt-based fiat dollar while they're taking actions over on the gold and silver side. Well, basically, they want a seller for what they're buying. They're buying gold. Uh, they're not going to say, we want the public to buy gold because we like it too. No, they're, they're more evil than that. They're saying gold is worthless, doesn't pay a yield. They, they put out these clowns like Warren Buffett 
Warren Buffett is, is a total liar and a clown. He comes out and says it doesn't earn a yield. Well, he's a liar because he was earning a yield for about three or four years with his buddy Hank Greenberg selling option calls on silver until he was called away, and then he lied again and said that he sold his silver too early. No, he was called away into a forced sale because he was earning 8 to 10 percent a month income on his silver holdings. What they want you to do is give up your gold and silver so that they can buy it at the cheap price. That's why they suppress the price. That's the old bash and stash technique from Wall Street? Well, sure. It, it, it's easy to do because they own the press. I don't know if, if uh, people are aware, but in the 70s, there were 25 different companies that owned the press in the United States. I'm referring to broadcast, print, radio, and, oh, I don't know, the magazines, whatever. There were 25 companies, now there are five. And the trust of the press has gone from something like a 40% figure in the 70s to a, about a 20% figure now. So, you know, with the consolidation of the press networks at a corporate level, they've lost their integrity. Um, but I'd like to point out some details that are not well known. Um, Clinton, Rubin... Papa Bush, they stole Fort Knox. It was 8,500 tons. They stole it. The people in Kentucky know full well what happened because trucks entered, armored trucks entered Fort Knox in caravans, like, you know, four or five at a time. And they all rode high. That's the terms for the, the vaulting industry. The, the trucks rode high which means that the, the height of the body of the truck was far off the ground. When they returned, they all rode low. And the Kentucky natives, they, well, they understand it very, very well. So for month after month after month after month, Fort Knox was drained during the Clinton-Rubin administration. What they did was they created a 0% gold lease opportunity. So just available for the Wall Street Bank. You couldn't have borrowed that gold for 0%. No, they borrowed it at 0%, and then they put on short contracts for the gold market and futures, and with the proceeds and the money left over, they would buy mountains of long treasury bond contracts. So the Clinton administration likes to talk about the decade of prosperity. I talk about the decade of stolen prosperity because the proceeds from the gold financed the reduction and rally, the redu reduction in, in bond yields and the rally in U.S. government debt via the Treasury bonds. So the Wall Street mavens made somewhere between 2 and $3 trillion on a leverage basis from stealing Fort Knox. They didn't get rid of that gold. They stored it. And what I've come to learn, see, there's a big question. We all know that there's a lot of naked, well, we don't all know. The enlightened people who follow the gold industry know that there's a tremendous amount of naked shorting of gold futures contracts and silver futures contracts. By that, I mean they sell a contract and never deliver the contract, never maintain the margin calls, are forgiven on it, roll it over to the next month, add on more short contracts, and since they don't maintain the margins, since they never deliver on the contract, they're called naked shorts. They're illegal, but the big banks in the United States are not subject to laws. They're in, they rag with impunity. So the big question has been going on for 10 years. If the big banks of Wall Street have all these huge short positions, who's got the other side? And the answer is the executives to the firms. The CEOs of the Wall Street firms have enormous gold commitments. They are the counterparties for the shorts that their companies hold. Companies short, executives long. It's nice balance. And it's actually an argument that goes against the likelihood of a force majeure, which means, well, due to economic situation and whatever, the whole nation's under siege, so we're going to cancel out these entire contracts. I don't think they will. I think they're going to gut those companies and make them forced into bankruptcy. 
because as they go into bankruptcy, the long contracts will be held by those executives. And where do they hold them? The company's called the Carlyle Group. They're often interviewed on respectable shows that have other harlots. But the Carlyle Group has lots and lots of Wall Street executives as investors. And this was all revealed by James Sinclair, Jim Sinclair, who I'm actually in touch with once in a while. He's a great guy. He's got his own background. So, you know, you've got these Western central banks, and they realize that a return to the gold standard would cripple the U.S. economy. So they're protected. They, they know the gold standard's coming, but they're protected because they, as individuals, own tremendous holdings, tremendous assets in gold. And they're largely not in the United States. They're, if they're not in the Carlaw Group, they're held in, in Caribbean locations, Swiss locations. So the risk for the return to the gold standard is to send the United States to the third world. Uh, no bankers in power, notice, ever cite the Austrian School of Economics and its teachings. But a lot of our guests here on Reluctant Preppers do, so please continue. Well, it's about sound money. It, it, they explain in the Austrian school what happens to a, not just a society, but to an economy and the, the structures of a nation financially. They all disintegrate. They, they decay. They fall apart. And that's what's happening in the United States. QE is not a revitalization. QE, the bond monetization, especially since it's unsterilized. I'd like to explain that. If the Fed decides, all right, we're going to buy $40 billion of Treasury bonds this month, but we're also going to remove $40 billion from the banking industry so as not to change the money supply. That's called sterilized. They're not doing that. They're just adding money to the system. It's unsterilized. It is acidic, hyper-monetary inflation that they all know well and good from their studies. It destroys the financial structures it kills capital. Now, I'd like to explain real briefly how it kills capital. Uh, as the, the Fed prints money, unsterilized, so just pure injections, what's the response by the system? Well, they see that the dollar is being undermined, so holders of treasury reserves in foreign countries, they start selling, they start diversifying out, they start buying more gold, they buy more maybe uh, huge energy deposits. So they diversify with a hedge into something that's hard asset and tangible. What do other companies do? Well, they start you know, doing things that are anti-dollar. They, they do the same thing. They invest in, say, a copper mine in Peru. They, they invest in something tangible, hard asset. They, they lighten their load of the treasuries that they hold as debt securities. So what happens to the global economy? Well, the prices go up. The costs go up. I've been making a big distinction for three years. It's not just a matter of price inflation. Where are the prices rising? It's the costs. The costs are rising from QE. As costs rise... The companies that sell product cannot raise their prices for end products so easily. So the result is that they have a squeeze on their profits. Then you have all these companies going into liquidation because they're failing. So they liquidate their inventories. Again, more downward pressure. You hear about the word deflation, which I, I hate the word deflation. People don't define it. They just use it without knowing what on earth they're talking about. So the result of QE is a squeeze on profit margins that shuts down businesses, forces liquidation, forces job cuts, and forces a feedback loop into the system where even fewer people have money in their pockets to keep the economy going. And then stage two, after, say, several months, we're into our fourth year of QE. So we're into several feedback cycle loops where the capital is being destroyed. And, and by that I mean the equipment is turned off. It is retired. It is liquidated in cases or it is just shoved in a, in a big warehouse. All these different widget making machines, all these different telephone and computing machines, all these networking relay racks and disk drives, they're not used. 
This is what QE is doing. It's killing capital on a global stage. How does that scale down into the individual family? We can imagine that with prices rising or with uh, jobs, layoffs, that sort of thing, some of the, those consequences are, are closer to home. Um, can, you, can you bring that down to an individual family scale in the, these global events that you're describing? What are some typical ways that that plays out for the individual family as a risk? Well, the big risk for the U.S. household is that as the dollar is rejected, you're going to see the impact economically of that rejection.